I'm Jeff Martin. This is Lead by Change, New York One. In this episode, we talk with John, CEO and founder of Betterment. We speak with Raul, CEO and founder of Tiny Bop, and Amy, the editorial director of Upworthy. I'm on my way to Gramercy in Manhattan to go meet with John Stein, CEO and founder of Betterment. We're gonna take a look at his offices and head over to Bose and have a conversation about being in TechCrunch Disrupt and also the milestones of running Betterment. How's it going? Nice to see you. Show me around a little bit? Yeah, sure, let's take a tour. I'd like to start with kind of going way back. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I uh, grew up there all 18 years. Uh, my parents were both city planners there uh, in Dallas, okay. and uh, I think I inherited from them many, many good things, including a love of maps. Okay. Because um, <laughs> they always had like a great, cool map spread out on, on the coffee table or something. So you're there for 18 years, so pretty much your whole kind of my upbringing. whole childhood. I, yeah. I was there. Yeah. Were you involved in technology early on? Not at all. You know, I, I don't think I even knew what you know, technology was, and it was all going on, right? Yeah, like, yeah. You know, but it just, it wasn't like a big deal in, in, yeah. in my life. When I graduated from college in 2001, um, you know, I had some friends who'd been in the tech sector, yeah. but they were all losing their jobs. Within that time, like growing up, it was, uh, what was your early conception of like money and, and money management? You know, growing up, I had a, a, an interest in stocks. I think in part because uh, every year around uh, uh, around Christmas, my, my grandparents would say, oh, you know, we should get John some Disney stock or something like that. Okay. And I would say, well, what about that? Like, you know, and I would never get it, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> that would be like a nice thing to get. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I actually remember looking at like the papers and like tracking the value of stocks and I just, I thought, my goodness, this is a complex thing. Like who actually yeah. reads all of this? Yeah. Like who looks at all of this And you stuff? understood the fact that it was like stocks were being traded and that they're companies and there's something some about level, that yeah. that was interesting to you. Yeah, but it wasn't really until I got to college and I took economics that yep. I got a real sort of framework for understanding how markets work and mm -hmm. how, um, uh, how economies work and yep. then the macro level of, of finance came, yeah. came from. Where that. did you go to school? So college? I went to Harvard for undergrad. Okay. And in my freshman year there, I took two classes that really shaped my, my worldview. One was uh, Intro to Economics with Marty Feldstein, who okay. was, uh, he was one of Reagan's economic advisors. All like right. Very efficient, markets driven, and um, and believed in rational decisions. And if we would all just make better decisions, the world would be a better place. And then I took human behavioral biology from Irv Devor, mm -hmm. who was uh, uh, this like liberal from southern Louisiana who grew up drinking pearl beer and got struck by lightning in Africa and just like <laughs> traveled the world doing doing interesting stuff and and talked about how you know despite our best intentions yeah. and what we would see as like the right decision. Uh, we often trip ourselves up and get in our own way, and uh, and and so and, and making good decisions is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I I always thought that those those two worldviews were really interesting, and yes. they they hit me at a formative time. Yep. And I think I've spent a lot of my life and career trying to reconcile those two things. Right. On the one hand, we should just make better decisions, and we'll be better off if we do. And on the yeah. other hand, that's really hard to do. If you look back at college for you. What was the most impactful thing that you learned that helped Betterment today? I think what uh, what I learned most in college uh, was the value of uh, of good decisions versus um, the difficulty of making them. I went deep on that yep. uh, and uh, and have a good understanding of financial theory 
Um, when I got out of college, I don't know that it, it helped me all too all, all that much because I started investing, you know, my graduation money myself. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and I made some of the same mistakes that I'd read about, you know, in, mm -hmm. in, in the in the economics classes, right? Like I uh, I bought Enron on the way down, which was like kind of a classically bad yeah bad bad decision. I made some good good investments too, and uh, and I netted out, you know, kind of kind of neutral. But I realized I was spending a lot of time on it, and mm -hmm. there were probably you know more productive things that I could be doing with, with yeah. that time. Yeah. If I were furthering my own career, for yep. instance, or just even spending that time with with friends, it would be better than you know than than, than spending all that time uh, kind of fruitlessly. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. Where did the concept of betterment come about? So it grew in part from that experience, right? From my yeah. own investing experience yeah. and having opened, you know, multiple different brokerage accounts and finding that none of them really steered me toward the right answer. They all steered me toward the right answer for them. Yep. Uh, it wasn't the right answer for me. Yep. Uh, and uh, and at the same time, I was working for banks and uh, as a consultant, mm -hmm. uh, my, my my first significant job out of out of school. And, uh, and I was learning all kinds of stuff. I was having a great time. I was living in New York and traveling around and, and working on product development and risk management, investment portfolio policy. I earned my CFA. So I was learning all this yeah. great stuff. Financial innovation. Financial stuff, right? Yeah. yeah like, but, but, I, but I found that most of, the, most of our uh, uh, products that we were, were developing didn't really take into account what the customers wanted, right? Mm -hmm. We would go on a six-month product development cycle and yep. like, never talk to the customers. Mm. And uh, you know, now that seems crazy to me. Yeah. We would never do that. Never. And I realized there's got to be a way to build products that put customers first, that uh, that align with their customers' interests. You know, you can still make money, but you you've got to you got to think about what the customer wants from this thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I don't feel like that's the place that most financial services are these days, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to build a, a financial service that you can love, one that makes yep. you happy, yeah, yeah. one that is really aligned with you. Understand the why of the people, right? Yeah. Understand what, what they want and why they want it. Exactly. Yeah. How old was the Petterment before you did uh, TechCrunch Disrupt? When we launched at TechCrunch Disrupt in May of 2010, we'd already been working on the service for two and a half years before, okay. before that. Okay. Two and a half years of regulatory approvals, two and a half years of tech bill. There was a significant investment. Okay. We were bootstrapping that whole time. You know, oh, we wow. were really yeah. just uh, on, on fumes. And it was a great way to launch. You know, we'd seen um, uh, uh, other companies like Mint.com launch mm -hmm. it at TechCrunch, and we yep. thought, well, if, if this worked for them, like, yep. this is a good forum for us. And it was. It was a great way to get out in front of a lot of people. Yep. What about New York do you like? Like as far as the tech scene and, and technology here versus maybe doing it somewhere New York's else. an amazing place to live. I mean, I'm I'm biased because I've lived here for 13 years now. Yeah. And uh, but you're and, not from here, so. Yeah. Right. right. But but it's a place it's a place where young people want to come from all over the country. So we have you know our team is people from the West Coast, it's people from the Midwest, it's mm. people from the South. It's you know maybe only 10% of the team is native New Yorkers. People really? come from all over. Uh, to come to New York. And uh, and it's because it's one of the greatest places to live in the world. You yeah, know, it's like the, it's like such an exciting city. There's so many different people and industries and events and interesting you know places to live and go out and go to parks. It's just like you know I'm so excited. I have a daughter now. I'm so excited that she gets to grow up here because mm. there's no place in the world where there's more more going on. Looking at milestones and look, kind of looking into the future, what do you what, what what kind of milestones do you have for yourself now, and where do you see the organization going? Ultimately, we want to make tens of millions of Americans uh, happier, right? Like we mm -hmm. want to build technology that makes them happy, and uh, and we're doing that through the lens of financial services and efficiency and how we can get them to better outcomes. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the the major milestone for us is when do we have you know 10 million customers on, on the platform? Mm -hmm. That's going to be that's going to be a big day. Yep. Uh, you know that's uh, still probably a few years out. We're over 100,000 customers now, okay. uh, and we're growing very quickly. But uh, but we'll get there. So as you scale and the company moves forward, what challenges do you see kind of on, on the horizon? Um, I think the toughest challenges for us are execution. 
right? If we, uh, we have a market leading position, we have uh, a great team, we have uh, the best technology, uh, we, uh, we have like real differentiation between us and, and everybody else in the yep. uh, robo advisor space, yep. right? Like we're just, we're head and shoulders above. If we execute well, uh, we're going to have, uh, uh, we're gonna do amazing things, right? Like we're gonna naturally come to occupy a large share of the market. We're gonna help millions of people. Uh, if we get uh, distracted um, and we start to try to do too many different things, mm -hmm. um, we will uh, we'll stumble. And I think, that's, I think that's the thing that scares me the most. Focusing on the right things. Focusing on the right things. Yeah, it's hard to know sometimes what are the right things. Sometimes you don't know until you've done them. Yes. <laughs> So I'd, I'd like to know, you know, straight from you, like, why should people invest this way versus the old traditional ways of investing? I mean, like, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Like, this is, it's just obviously better than anything else you could do with your money. So yeah. um, the way that we used to invest makes no sense. Like, the idea that you should go and pick stocks or funds and then tax manage them and rebalance them. Like, why would you do that? It's like, it's like, like yes, those are the right things to do, but to do those things yourself is like, it's like maintaining your own car. Maybe it's a fun hobby. Maybe it's something yeah. you want to do on the weekends. Yeah. But you know, it should not be something that most of us have to do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and we're moving very quickly towards a world where people don't have to do that anymore. It's mm -hmm. like it's like if you could perform surgery on yourself, would you want to do that? Maybe. Like you you could probably do not. that, but you probably shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we're doing with our old-fashioned investing system. Yeah. You know, like this idea of self-directed investing, it was kind of forced on people um, yeah. over the last 40 years, mm -hmm. uh, and it was it's just not the right thing like we're in the early days of, uh, of thinking about how do we plan for long-term mm -hmm. uh, retirement and how do we plan for uh, you know when, when, when we are only working for a portion of our of our lives right we need to set up a system to take care of people yeah. um, for the remainder of their lives that they're, that they're not working yeah we're still just figuring that out because this is only a situation that's existed for a few decades right and it's Absolutely. a brand new thing to us as a species it's not something that we've like adapted to and we're building the way that that, that should happen um, over the, the next hundred years what was some of the best advice that you've received that's really helped you and helped Betterment? When I think about like advice and when I think about things that are often in my mind, I, I often think of uh, uh, something that my uh, grandfather and then my mother um, have, have said to me um, again and again, which is like to those who, who much is given, much is expected, right? And I feel like when you're in a good spot, like yep. you've got to do really good things and sort of like pay that, pay that forward. Yeah. Um, and I feel like, uh, I, I just I think about that a lot. I think that has something to do with like how I think about happiness. Yeah. That you know, as long as you're pursuing um, something that you feel is good and uh, and valuable to the world, um, you don't you're not pursuing your own happiness, but you sort of tend to find it along the way. Hmm. Uh, and that's um, you know, it's worked for me so far. So. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. I don't know how you would not find talent in New York. There are so many people here. I found it really fascinating talking to John when he was talking about um, how so many of his people are from the East Coast, the West Coast, and uh, Midwest, and that you know there's only a small group of them that are like New Yorkers themselves. Most of them are transplants. I thought that was really fascinating. On my way to meet with Amy O'Leary of Upworthy. We're meeting at the Grind co-working space on the west side. Really excited to talk to Amy. She's really doing something unique where she's blended technology and storytelling. Early in Amy's career, she was working with a software company, early days of mobile technology, studying at Salt Institute, working with Ira Glass, New York Times, and now she's bringing it all together to tell stories at Upworthy that combine tech and storytelling.
Thank you for meeting with me today. Uh, there's been a lot of questions I've had for a long time, and I've gone to you for a lot of questions throughout the years because I think you're the master of the story. I wanted to talk to you today because our audience is a lot of tech leaders and tech professionals, tech executives, and also CEOs of tech firms. And so I wanted to sit down with you and learn a little bit more about storytelling. Going back where we actually first met, and I think it's about 15 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, a little startup called Gearworks where we're doing handheld mobile technology. How did you see your role at the time? I mean, like any startup, we all had a million jobs, we wore a million hats, but I think you're right. I think in the different roles I had at that startup over its four-year trajectory that I was with the company, my job was really, I was the one communicator at the company, a company full of product people and engineers, and so my job was to go around and really listen to everyone yeah. and ask them questions about what we were building, ask them questions about their interactions with our customers, um, ask our CEO and CTO questions about their interactions with investors. And then my job was really to synthesize all of that into easy to tell, easy to understand stories that would communicate what this company was doing, which was a crazy thing. We were building mobile technology, you know, at the turn of the millennium, which almost yep. no one was doing. So you really had to put some craft and effort into how you talked about that story since it was such a newly emerging market. So you transitioned out of tech. Yeah. From Gearworks, you went to Self Institute and you studied documentary. Is that right? Radio documentary? Yeah, you know, my ambition had always been to, to be in journalism in some form. And while I loved working a startup, I kind of knew that my real skill set was probably closer to storytelling and journalism. Yep. So I made the decision to go do a graduate program um, because my real dream was to work at This American Life. Okay. Um, and so I did a, a program that taught me how to do interviews and how to, to find stories and how to be responsible about them, which is what you learn in a documentary program that's really served me then through the rest of my career. Yeah, if I remember actually back at that time mm -hmm. when you were trying to get an intern at This American Life, mm -hmm. I believe you told me that you listened to their stories mm -hmm. and you figured out the formula. Sure. And used that to apply to the role, which you ended up working there as an intern, is that correct? Yeah, so um, I'm a big believer that a lot of things that people think are talent are really skills that you can build. Yep. And storytelling is no different. So if you look at someone going, man, they're telling an amazing story. How could I ever learn to do that? I'm a big believer that you can analyze stories, break them down, and then what was really wonderful about This American Life is they're very good at taking lots of different stories and placing them into a simple but highly effective structure mm. that makes almost anything you say utterly compelling. From This American Life, you went to New York Times. So I was hired at the New York Times actually uh, in 2007 as their first ever audio producer. Now that was this little window in time where everybody thought the future of journalism was gonna be this really awkward thing called an audio slideshow. But I was really glad I got in the door there because I actually had seven different jobs in seven years. Oh, wow. um, I was everything from a traditional reporter to a news editor, and I worked a lot on digital change because it was clear to me with my background having worked at a tech startup, um, being one of the few journalists at the New York Times who knew how to talk to engineers, that there were some pretty significant things that we were falling behind on. Um, and I cared very deeply, I still do, about the institution of the New York Times. I think it's really important for society, and yep. I, wanted, um, I wanted to do what I could to help the paper make its transition towards a fully digital era. From the New York Times, you now have moved on to Upworthy. Mm -hmm. And it seems like such a great place for you to be, and a, you're such a great person for Upworthy, melding the technology that you understand, the technology world, the storytelling world, um, and bringing that all together. Um, what makes Upworthy different than the other digital online media companies? Yeah, Upward is really unusual, and so when uh, I first started talking to them, at, you know, I, I wasn't actually planning to leave the New York Times. I was expecting to have a long, a long and thriving career there. But, you know, something really got me about Upworthy, which is that, and, and you wouldn't know this just by looking at our website, 
Um, Upworthy is the most data-driven storytelling company you could possibly find. Under the hood, uh, we collect more data about how our stories work, if they're effective, if they work on changing people's minds, attitudes, and perceptions. And so it's kind of... How do you, how do you collect that data? Well, we do, we do a couple things. I mean, we certainly watch every possible signal indicator from, you know, our, our online readership. So we, we, you know, I have a weekly meeting as, as kind of the, the lead editor at Upworthy where we look at up to eight different data factors for every single story we publish that week and we analyze what happened with it. Um, but we also, you know, we have um, a social psychologist PhD on staff and we run surveys. Uh, so we might tell a certain story and then ask people what their attitudes were about something uh, before or after they saw the story so we can actually see if the story has changed people's minds or opinions. Um, because we're really interested in not just telling great stories but being effective with it. Okay. And I think that you know, if you look at most traditional journalism organizations, they want to tell true and accurate stories, which is an important and noble mission. Upworthy is interested in something bigger. We have a mission, which is to tell stories for a better world. We ask ourselves with every story, if a million people saw this, would the world be a better place? So we, put a, we don't publish as many stories as most other places, but the stories we do publish are finely crafted from story selection to, to creation to editing to be as powerful, impactful, and to reach as many people as possible. Um, I don't know anywhere else where storytelling and data are merged in a single pursuit. From the perspective of tech leaders, CEOs and founders mm -hmm. of emerging tech companies, mm -hmm. um, these people need to tell stories, right? Yeah. And they, they may be telling different stories, but they all need to tell stories. What is the one thing that most of those people get wrong when telling the story? I think it's a, it's a great question because I get really impatient with bad storytelling and I see it from you know, technology and business all the time. And the main problem is that I think most leaders, you know, they know what their marketing materials say, they know what their company's messaging is, and they kind of stick to that script. Unfortunately, most marketing is meant to be completely positive, completely, what I would say, anodyne, stripped of any... Vanilla. Yeah, vanilla. Right. And like, who's interested in that? Like, we all have seen enough stories and enough marketing messages to know, like, boring, turning it off, that's not authentic. Yeah. To break through, what you need to do is you need to find a real story of a real person. So whether that's if you're, if you're recruiting a star you want to bring into your team, you need to tell them about somebody else at your company. You know, we had this guy named Jerry and he came in one day and tell them the story of Jerry and how he thrived at your yep. company. If you are talking to, you know, to customers or consumers, you need to tell them the story of another customer or another consumer and, and you got to add those little details mm -hmm. that actually have nothing to do with your product. A good example is if I'm talking about, you know, a, a little kid and I'm talking about this little kid named Billy. I could talk about Billy just as the kid who's going to use this new app. Or I could tell you that, you know, Billy's got alligator tennis shoes, he calls his dog Stuffy Head, and he hates green peas. <laughs> and now you care a little bit more about Billy because you can imagine him yeah. as a fully rounded character. Yeah. So including details and, uh, that, and including people and not just including marketing messages, is a big part of how you break through to use the human brain's natural information structure, which is hardwired for stories, yep. to kind of use that system to get your message across. Mm. Um, so you tell the story, and then the moral is your, is your marketing message, rather than making your whole bit the marketing message. How, do you, how does an executive find a story? Like, like, well, you know, like they're yeah. doing their job. They're making sure, sure the servers are running and, mm -hmm. and that, you know, the Salesforce.com implementation is going well. Right. You know, um, where do they go to find these stories? I mean, there's two ways. One, great stories should be running across any executive's desk. If you want to know how things are going, you know, from your salespeople in the field, they should be telling you how, how things are going. So part of that is just having a radar and an alertness to the stories that exist within your company already and know which ones to grab and hang on to for a presentation or for an interview. Okay. Um, but the other is really listening. And I would encourage, you know, if, if a busy executive doesn't have time to do that listening, which they generally 
generally don't, this is a great thing to send somebody out to do, to go on a listening tour, to take notes, to record interviews with people inside and outside your company, and, and to sift those back. I mean, I've done consulting for companies where I've gone in and interviewed you know, employees and customers, and then edited those stories down to be like beautifully told versions of what's happening within mm. their own company. Um, there are a lot of ways to do it, but I, it really does start with listening. You're not going to, they're not going to land on your desk neatly wrapped up in a bow. You've got to go out and look for them. Excellent. So the, the art of storytelling, the mm -hmm. pattern is, what is it again? You want to have a sequence of events yep. and then a, an idea about what that means or a moral of the story. So yeah. if you can, you, and, and really the big secret here is you can take any story and make it vastly more interesting by putting a little bit of thought behind how you're presenting it to your audience and what that moral is. So today, what is the moral of the story? <laughs> I think today's moral is that storytelling is one of the most hugely powerful tools we have to communicate with each other. We can change people's minds. We can explain who we are. Um, we can connect with people. And we're much more effective when we do that through a traditional story than when we do it through just saying, hi, my name's Amy, and I'm the editorial director at Upworthy. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Jeff. Always great to speak with you. You know, everybody knows kids' stories have a moral, right? Um, but I don't know where that got lost once we became adults and we forgot that there should be a moral to every story. And I thought that was kind of interesting and simple. Today we're meeting with Raul Gutierrez, CEO and founder of TinyBop. TinyBop's a company that makes iPad games for kids. We're gonna go by their offices, check them out, then swing over to Red Lantern Bicycles, talk a little bit more, and then hopefully go for a ride. Hi, how are you? Welcome so this to is the Tiny place, Bob. huh? Yep, this is, Excellent. this is the spot. And we wanted to just have an open space so that everybody um, can all work together out here. And then uh, we need to have a conference room also just so that we could, uh, okay. uh, you know, work on projects. And this so, is cool. Uh, this oh, is wow. where, like, you know, we need to crunch on a project or, or yep. figure something out. Post-it notes are, like, our, our Agile? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is great. You have a lot of Macs. Uh, yes, uh, we have a lot of Macs. <laughs> we make uh, iOS apps, but actually, even if we were doing Android, you'd still do it all on Mac. Uh, we're yeah. uh, at a core creative studio, and so um, uh, that's our tool. I've collected children's books my whole life, and so have you really? Yeah, I have. Uh, I was, since you were a child, right? Since I was, I was a child, I was but I was, I was, a, a, I was a guy in college who had like children's books in my college what? room, which you know didn't always go over well. <laughs> um, I wanted to always have reference and then also serve as a point of inspiration. Do you bring kids into the office all the time? Yeah, so we we test all our apps with kids in the office, and we try to go to schools and. You know, I'm the guy at the birthday party, like trying to get the kids to play the apps. The hail in the cab. Well, only outside of New York is that considered anything. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> exactly. So, why did you choose um, this area of Brooklyn? Um, we actually, we were in Dumbo, which is this area, right, it's, it, the, the acronym means Down Under Manhattan Bridge, and Dumbo is like one of the hot tech areas here. There's over 80 startups in that one tiny little area. Really? Um, but the prices have also been going way, way up, and uh, so we wanted to be close to there. We also wanted to be close to where everybody lived. So we actually, we had 20 people, we mapped where everybody lived on a map. And we said, okay, what's kind of the, the center of it? And it ended up being here. So let's start from the beginning. Sure. Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in, I was born in Mexico and I grew up mainly in Lufkin, Texas. Okay. Um, and Lufkin is this tiny town in East Texas. Um, I always describe it as an island surrounded by trees instead of water. Interesting. 
Um, when I grew up there, there was, you know, way pre-internet. There was one channel on television. Uh, they had Farm and Ranch News with Horace McQueen. Um, there wasn't a lot of outlet to the outside world. So I have five kids, and yeah. I've experienced kids and their relationships with toys are very different. Mm -hmm. So uh, the oldest, my stepson, um, likes human toys, meaning, that's what my wife always says, meaning that he likes interaction with people instead of a toy. Right. Um, my 10-year-old loves, like, collecting things. Like, he mm -hmm. even has all my old G.I. Joe guys, right? And he right. likes to collect them and put them up and, and really can play by himself with those toys. Mm -hmm. And it seems like kids are very different on how they play. through. What types of toys did you play with? And I, I had, uh, compared to today's childhood, it was, like, fairly sparse in terms of the, the number of toys I had. My parents were really good about giving me tools. So, mm -hmm. um... I had like my dad's Pentax camera was, by the time I was seven, I was sort of obsessed with it. I was taking a lot of pictures with the camera. Uh, I made Super 8 movies. And um, that I was not supposed to play with, but like my parents would go out of town. It was back in the era when your parents would go on vacation alone. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Uh, they'd leave you at home and I'd, we'd stay with our grandmother or something. Yeah. And, um, and so we would sneak the camera, and I, I don't even remember how we bought film, but uh, we would make these little movies, and we made these elaborate, you know, our version of Star Wars, or mm -hmm. I was really into stop motion, so I did these very, very elaborate stop motion movies. And more so than any toy that you played with, like those were, I was really, like, I love these tools that you can make things with. Yeah. What did you do before you started TinyBot? I've done many things. So like, okay. I, I, my, my career is not a, sort of a, a, a standard career. Uh, I've always worked. I've worked since I was a kid. I've always had businesses. Uh, I used to write software. I used to cut grass. I, I used to make museum displays, like when I was in high school, hmm. um, for our local museum. Uh, in college, a after college, I was supposed to go to China but because of Tiananmen Square, I couldn't go. Um, and I landed in a, uh, a law firm job that I hated. Okay. And, and uh, I had some stuff happen in my life. I, I lost like my mom and my brother, and I spent like two years traveling around the world. Uh, and after I came out of that, I ended up in Hollywood. And it wasn't any plan. It was just that I had a couple of friends who were there. And... Uh, just out of luck, on my second day there, I got a job with Scott Rudin, who's a very well-known producer. And so, like right away, I was like working at Paramount and mm -hmm. you know going through the Paramount gates every day, which was pretty awesome. What kind of yeah. roles did you play within Hollywood? Uh, I started as the lowliest, lowliest assistant, and this was an office that had like a, a hierarchy of assistants of, of you know there I think there were seven when I started. And um, the lowliest assistant had to do just like these very humble jobs. But little by little, I worked my way up. Um, not necessarily through good work, but often through attrition because it was a job in which a lot of people got fired. Yeah. Um, and eventually, I was sort of like his right hand guy uh, traveling around. Um, you know, uh, we were working on five movies at any given time, and then also Broadway plays. And mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I was on the set from beginning to end. Yeah. And I think the first movie I worked on was Clueless, and the last movie I worked on was The Truman Show. Um, okay. So I was there for a little bit of a span. Um, and even though it was a long period of time in my life, I learned a lot because each movie is like a little startup. You start with an idea, you have to develop it, you hire a bunch of people, you have to make the thing, you have yep. to sell the thing. Yep. Um, and you and, do that over and over again. And you do it over and over again. Mm. Um, I'd worked for other people for a long time, and um, I knew that I wanted to be in mobile also because I'd been around the block from the beginning of computers, yeah. basically, or home computers. And it seemed to me that the world was going this way, and it was just a tidal wave that was happening. And so I wasn't really... I, I gave myself a year. I put myself in a co-working space, and I just had a list of ideas that I was going through. None of them actually had anything to do with kids' uh, mm. things. And uh, it was in the middle of that year that 
one of my kids came to me and he was about to have a birthday party. I think it was a kindergarten birthday party. He asked me if he could trade his birthday party for an iPhone. And if you know anything about kindergartners, like the birthday party is pretty much like the centerpiece of, yeah. of that year. Yeah. And you know, not that's only the most was, important thing for a kid is that having that birthday party, right? That's it. Yeah. And so not only was he willing to sell out all his friends, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was his favorite toy. And that moment, like, really, like, made me stop. And it made me not so much to, as a business thing. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to understand it as a parent. Yeah. Because I, as a parent, had like a, a sort of troubled relationship with screen time. I didn't like. I felt like it was like sort of keeping kids away from 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 parents and from that sort of interaction. The woods. Um, right. It's it, it, keeping away from the woods. They're not building things. It felt like they were just consuming. So I wanted to understand it. And so. I went through and I really started tracking everything he was doing and I downloaded like the top 100 like kids and educational apps and I played with them and at the end of that I think I realized or I, that the form it's just a tool it's a tool like those tools that I used to have mm -hmm. you know it's like no different really than the camera or uh, super 8 in fact it's both of those things but it was also all these other things and there were very few people in the kids' world creating kids' content that I thought were deserving of my kids' attention. There, there were a lot of things that were really disposable and that were just essentially trying to stimulate them into some sort of game loop uh, that involved them buying more coins and it's yeah. like a monkey pressing. Uh, yeah. And I want to do the opposite of that. Um, Kids nowadays don't have the woods. Like even if they live in the woods, they probably don't go out in the woods mm -hmm. like in the way that we used to. Yep. Um, I wanted to create like a set of apps that would allow them to sort of explore the world and like maybe understand a little bit more about the world, uh, and to uh, bring up questions in kids to drive them closer to their parents. Mm -hmm. And so out of that, the first series that we developed called the Explorers Library. Um, came up, and these are big subjects that every kid everywhere needs to know about. Yep. So the human body, uh, plants, the earth, um, we have weather coming out, you know, space is on, on there. What's great is that the, you know, we start each of these, these apps by asking, what does a kid know about the subject? How has it been taught in the past? And you find out that kids actually don't know that much. Like hmm. most six-year-olds don't know that there's a tube that connects their mouth and the other end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like it's it's some sort of weird magic. They don't they don't understand that. And when you reveal that, they they suddenly understand something about themselves that's hmm. really important. And the feedback we get from parents constantly is, oh, my kids are like actually asking all these great questions. Yeah. Um, and so it's not something that drives kids away from parents. It actually drives them towards them. Your first app was which one? Our first app was Human Body, uh, and it was it sort of set the the um, the template for this Explorers Library series. Okay. Uh, well, the original sort of inspiration was the, those old dictionaries or encyclopedias that had the transparencies of the yep. body, and we thought like, wouldn't it be cool if we could do that and then bring it to life? And um, all of our apps are what we call uh, explorable uh, explanations. Okay. So it's, um, they're not really a game in the traditional sense, it's a simulation. What was one of the big first milestones for the company? Well, I mean, with getting the app, the first app out um, was a sort of pretty colossal task. At the beginning, we were only four people. Um, and I think our goal for the first month was 10,000 downloads. Um, and we had 8,000 downloads in the first day. Hmm. Um, so, you know, that was sort of one milestone, you know, and then eventually you get to a million downloads. And, yeah. You know, now we're sort of in the many millions of downloads. But, um, you know, that first, like, we didn't know if it was going to work at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the, the App Store is this amazing distribution platform. Yeah. And we, you can hit a button and reach everywhere in the world and we're heavily localized, we're in 50, 60 languages. When we hit that button the first time, we didn't know like if it was gonna connect. 
Um, and I think we got back the numbers on the first day and we, we had said that there were three downloads. And I was like, ah, you know, we're sunk. I gotta that do something rough, else. That sounds like a rough day. Yeah, and you know, we've made, it's like, you know, made six bucks. And then I noticed that those three downloads were like in the last seconds, like they had just oh. gotten under the wire of the last seconds of the day. Okay. Um, and so, it, you know, the actual number for that first day was like 8,000 downloads, hmm. which, which is it's pretty good. And That's then, awesome. Uh, and then we've done other things, like we did this thing called Free App of the Week with Apple, where we gave the app away for free. Yeah. I said, what can we expect from this? And I said, well, maybe if like you do well, you'll get like 100,000. Really well, you get 300,000 downloads during the week. Uh, on the first day, we had 8, 800,000 downloads. Oh, wow. Um, and over the week, we had like four points, whatever million. What, what's been like the largest challenge from a, as a company with Tiny Bob? Like, what is the thing that you struggled with maybe for the longest period of time that you think you might have solved now? Discovery is always a challenge, like having people find you and sort of understand what you are. Um, discovery within the App Store? Discovery within the App Store is a okay. huge challenge because, you know, there's, you're up there with a million other apps. Um, a lot of those other apps are like, you know, big company marketing something or they're things that, you know, built by a single guy who's gotten his app up. And so there's like very little differentiation in terms of quality. You're um, all on the same platform. You're all on the same platform yeah. and you're all, there's very little sort of weight. There are things that sort of we've, risen above uh, in that, you know, you get like editor's choice and our robot app got uh, iPad app of the year for last year. Um, so there are things like that that kind of differentiate you a little bit. Um, but ultimately for us, it's really been about this sort of slow building a brand, having a parent trust you because they, they bought one of your apps and their kids was asking good questions or kids building something with the other app. And so that means that each time that we put out an app, um, people buy into the system more. And so it wasn't sort of one particular lightning bolt. It's just been this like long, hard slog. But it means that every time we put out something new, we have a higher and higher amplitude opening. So I have one final question. Mm -hmm. And the question is, looking back, has there been some advice that uh, someone gave you that helped guide you through your journey? And that maybe still helps you today. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, for me, one of the things uh, that was really powerful in my life was hanging out with my grandfather. So my grandfather was a shoemaker and loan shark <laughs> in Mexico. Um, and I used to travel around with him, and uh, he used to um, collect all the things he needed to make shoes, and leather, and there was like dyes and, you know, different parts and things. Um, and uh, he, at the same time, was doing his loan shark business in which he was sort of maybe collecting somebody's ring as collateral <laughs> and so on. And he would bring me along and I was, you know, like little. Um, and sometimes when he was doing the loan sharking, uh, you know, there would be these emotional scenes where, where mm. and, um, and he was always incredibly kind to people. And uh, it was not the type of loan shark that was gonna break anybody's leg. Yeah. Uh, it was just like, well, he was gonna have your wedding ring like if you didn't pay him back. Yeah. And he was always kind to them. And I think even when people were not necessarily being sort of nice to him back. And he, he always told me that if you, you know, if you were kind to everybody, uh, and if you try to, to do that, um, then people always think well of you, uh, and that it'll make your your business easier. And I, I don't know if that's like uh, uh, sort of an overriding principle, but I try to do that. I I, I try to do that um, in my company, and that's that's great. Well, thanks for being kind and <laughs> being on our show. It was fun spending the day with Raul Old at Brooklyn and learning more about Tiny Bop. And when we talked about advice, it was very similar to John. Uh, Raul said that it was about kindness, and John said it was about giving back. Amy taught us that every great story has a moral, and I believe in this story, it's really about kindness and giving back. At the end of the day, that's the most important thing.
is New York ruthless? Or is New York kind? New York is kind. Yeah, New York is kind. Um, but you have to sort of you have to crack that exterior shell. You, you really, on the surface, it's, it's very cold and lonely. And, uh, and, and yeah, lonely. It's a really lonely town. But once you, once you break beyond that sort of surface and once you get connected and plugged in, it's, uh, it's a wonderful city. It's warm. And it's, it's great. I awesome. love this town. Hey, this is Jeff Martin again. If you go to leadbychange.com, you can see this show and other shows. If you subscribe, you can get early access to new shows and also exclusive content. Thanks for watching.